Hello my brothers and sisters of Dior, welcome back to Dior, I'm a Celtic Templar, and welcome back to another how-to video. And on this month of March, uh, well, y'all voted in second place, uh, after what if Britannia was never invaded, y'all pretty much, uh, well, voted for, when it came to our how-to videos, for the Gallic noble from the 3rd to 1st century BC to be one of our first for this month of March. Now, what exactly was a Gallic noble? What exactly were they outfitted with? How famous were they in history? Well, that is actually a really good question, you might ask. Well, the information of our historical analysts on the 3rd to 1st century BC on the Gallic nobles would pretty much be a various assortment of warriors. Now, the nobles would be the most outfitted of them all. Many much, mostly, they would be wearing this. Mail. Mail was the most expensive of armor at that point in time. And the fact is, it's actually stated that the Gallic nobles armored themselves in various types of armor and equipment, pretty much depending on their region. For example, the further south you went in Gaul, the more and more the uh, Gallic nobles or Gallic warriors would have probably, instead of wearing mail, they would have had something like the uh, Greek Lionel Thorax of which is linen and glue. And the fact is, this is because due to, well, uh, much influence to the said Greek uh, and Roman, uh, well, colonization in the southern points in Gaul. So the fact is, the Gauls would have ended up, well, adopting certain type of armor in the southern regions. The same can also be said about padded armor. The padded armor would also be the same. Instead of the, unlike with their northern tribal cousins, they would technically stated to have worn a flowing type of straight pattern design padded tunic, that of which would have been sleeveless. Now this is from prior before the 3rd century, but there are accounts that during the time of the 3rd century, they, especially when it came to the southern regions of Gaul, the Gallic nobles would have had padded armor looked like that of which had tassels on those said legs, which you will soon see. Now, there is also the uh, stated of the Gallic sword. Actually, even further, the further south you went in Gaul, the more and more the Gallic sword looked like that of a Roman or Greek design handle. While the further north you went, the more and more you would actually see the oval style shields look more and more hexagonal, like that of the Germanic tribes. It could also be stated that even the further north you went, the more and more the helmets would be different in their variation. Now, helmets in general varied from uh, person to person, because one, they, the Celts weren't one uniform people. In other words, uh, certain tribes didn't prefer this helmet or that one, it just depended on the user. Me, I preferred the Monotitfino Celtic design like this, because one, this, this feels Celtic to me the most. They also mostly used the infamous spiral design, which I call this one the pinhead model, because <laughs> one, every time I wear something like this, this just reminds me of a pinhead, and you will soon see why. Then there's also the infamous Roman Galician design, or the Gallic design style helmet, which is the most uh, inspired design. Then there is also another design that did come out during the first century BC, and this one is little talked about, but the thing is, unlike with other helmets, this actually, instead of it having just a back neck plate, it has an entire covering all around the sides, kind of like a kettle helm. So, it's kind of an impressive design, but I don't have any of those, and I tried looking online, they don't have them either. So yeah. Now, Gallic armor varied from user to user. Some, as I stated, the further south you went, the more and more you would have seen Greek lentil thorax, or as well padded armor, depending on their status and wealth. While the further north you went, the more and more the padded armor would look, uh, well, more tapered to the body instead of having tassels on it. And as well, there would also be mail. Mail would probably be the most iconic of armor throughout the continental Celtic regions. And the fact is, it's little known of what was ever carried out from the Celts of Iberia or Gaul, so because both sides, uh, both groups used it a lot. Now, the Celtic Gallic 
people actually use this in such a variety that it's actually stated that during the sacking of Rome by the Celtic chieftain Brennus, many Celts actually wore this. The same could also be said about another Celtic chieftain named Brennus, who also sacked uh, the city of Delphi. And it's actually stated that the Celts were one of the most fearsome warriors. In fact, the Romans didn't prefer calling them Celt. They called them Gauls. In fact, anybody that was north of Italy was viewed as a Gaul. Anything uh, that looked like a Celt was called a Gaul. I don't know why, but they, that's what they called them. And the fact is, the Gauls were one of the most fearsome warriors in history, and were actually the prized mercenary warriors. Now, what do I mean by this? Simple. These guys were actually seen throughout the Mediterranean, and even further. In fact, there are accounts that stated that they were used as mercenaries by Carthage, Macedonia, ancient Greece, uh, Persia, the Seleucid Empire, the uh, Ptolemaic Empire, even the ancient Egyptian Bronze Age, or even prior before the invasion of the uh, Persians and such into Egypt, they were also mercenaries to Egypt. And in fact, they were even mercenaries to the Etruscans, the Persians, and pretty much as far as we know. And the fact is, Celtic mail was the superb armor. In fact, it's actually stated that Celtic mercenaries, instead of wearing uh, regular style armor, what they would wear, it, if depending on the region, they would rather prefer wearing mail because this would be the most superb armor. In fact, it's actually stated that a Celtic mercenary could actually become a nobleman even though he was born of common birth. In other words, if I was, say, a commoner in a Gallic uh, tribe or a town, I or village or whatever you want to call it, I would end up, well, becoming a mercenary in order to actually, well, show myself off and in doing so gain wealth and reputation. And guess what? That's what happened. And many Celtic tribesmen actually became extremely wealthy nobles and actually even became, <laughs> this is really what I find really amazing, they even became personal guards to kings and emperors from faraway lands. In fact, it's actually stated that the great um, uh, King Heracles, Heracles, or Her Hero, I can't remember if I can remember the name, but, it, but apparently it's during the time of the Greek culture. He actually was stated to have more Gallic mercenaries than he did soldiers protecting the royal palace. So these guys were Varangian guards before Varangian cards ever existed. And in fact, Gallic nobles were stated to fight in light style formation, but as well keep in a type of design in formation nearly identical to, to, the, to said Greek hoplite. They would use a various types of assortment of equipment, depending on, uh, well, where they came from and how much wealth they had. Now, as we see, I'm wearing pretty much what the highest class of Gallic noble would have worn. Now, this is a lot different compared to their Celtic cousins across the channel in Britannia, but I'll probably have to cover them some other time, hopefully next year, in uh, next uh, Celtic month, so yeah, so probably next March of, of next year, so yeah. So, why would they actually dress like this, you might ask? Well, simple. The Celtic equipment varied from person to person. Because as I said, the further south you went, the more Greek or Roman influence you got, or Mediterranean influence you got. Well, the further north you went, the more Celtic you got. It, which was kind of common. But, uh, as well I almost forgot to mention, uh, there are accounts that even stated that Gallic noble horsemen actually used greaves on their legs. Especially if you were further south. In fact, is the Romans did use them as mercenary units, or in this case, auxiliary troops, after they conquered Gaul. And the Romans stated that these guys were ferocious on the battlefield with their long swords and their light lightning attack formation, which is kind of why even Augustus Caesar wanted to tie Gaul more closely to the Roman Empire rather than for it away. So you can see why Augustus Caesar kind of wanted to make sure that the Gauls were treated better than most other people in, like, say, parts of Germania. Now, 
Uh, though this does actually explain a lot because one, in across the Rhine River, we do have Gallic settlements that do look near identical to that of the said Celts across the Rhine, depending on their type of region. It though depended on their wealth and status because one, much Celtic swords like this were were different in variations in designs, so it depended on the user. Now, the most impressive thing about the Celtic nobles was this, the Celtic torque. The torque showed that I am a free man. I am, it kind of actually shows off my wealth and status. Now, many people automatically think though, Alpha Templar wear the horned helmets, Skallagrim said that the Celts wore horned helmets. No, that is actually not true at all. Celts did not actually wear horned helmets. There is this style of helmet, but this is not actually a horned helmet. This is actually what you would call a chieftain's ceremonial helm, meaning it is a Britannic chieftain style helm that would be used kind of like a crown would be. So yeah. Now the Celts did actually use other various ceremonial style helms but these were meant for ceremonies. They were not meant for warfare use. For warfare use, they did sometimes put uh, some sort of uh, jewelry, or in this case, a bird, a hog, or something like this on top, because one, there was even accounts that stated that the wings flapped on these mechanical beasts as though they rode toward them. This is kind of what's horrified the Romans so much, especially during the Battle of the Alia, or as a lot of us historians call it, the slaughter at the Alia where the Romans were massacred by the Celts. So, yeah. Now, in truth though, Gallic swords are probably the most impressive and most badass of them all. This is kind of one of my favorites. This is based off a historical type Celtic style uh, sword, which was made out of fully iron. And there are some accounts that state that these would have been made uh, fully iron style hilts. In other words, it would have been a decorated hilt, but this would have cost a lot. So mostly they would have actually used bronze or even gold sometimes. And as well, they would actually make beautiful works of art in the handle grip. As you see right here, the handle grip actually has beautiful artwork on it. We see a long flowing hair, we see eyes, we see a mustache, we see the human body itself. Which, that's the thing about the Celts. The Celts believe that if you kill somebody with an infamous sword like this, you can actually trap their soul in the blade. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, so yeah, I'm not going to try doing that. Uh, but the Gallic noble warriors would have used these type of weapons, not just of a hurling, cutting weapon like most Roman depictions say. They used them also as a thrusting weapon and a cutting weapon depending on their wealth and status. Now there are different variations. Some accounts actually go that even these, like this, would have actually had beautiful jewels, uh, jewelry in it, like rubies and emeralds. Other accounts stated that they were made out of wood. So with a wooden handle grip with that, or sometimes even a mercury metal handle grip, which that's kind of beautiful. But one thing I do love about these Celtic swords is that the fact they lock the hand in place, meaning I don't lose the sword, it flows with me. I can easily control it. So yeah. Uh, but as well, another thing that would also be different would be their scabbards. The scabbards would vary from variation to variation. Some were wooden scabbards, some were leather like this. Other accounts were actually stated to be of a fully metal tile type of scabbard. The scabbard would have been fully metal over a wooden uh, design. I had a buddy try and make me one, sadly kind of screwed up the uh, scabbard after I gave him specific uh, showings on the scabbard of how it was made, so yeah. But I, I, can, I can't blame him, it's his first time ever making a Celtic sword or a scabbard, so yeah, he, I told him to have it make sure it's a tight fit for the hand as it's supposed to lock in place. He forgot about that part, so yeah. Uh, but what can you do? Now, Gallic nobles were probably the most prized, infamous uh, type of warriors in history. Because one, these guys showed off that they were the boss. And the fact is, instead of be 
staying behind their army, they would actually be in the ranks with their men, holding the line with them in a type of shield wall formation. Except the Gallic noble would be in the center. In other words, he would actually lock the shields in place. Instead of the shields overlapping like a traditional Viking shield wall as we know, like my shield overlaps this guy, well somebody overlaps mine. Since I'm a Celtic chieftain, and if I overlap both shields, guy to my right and my left, his shield is uh, fully actually locked. The same with the guy right next to me. So, in doing so, they are locked right behind the shields. This means that it makes it almost impossible to push these guys back. And the fact is, this is actually what also causes it to be a little more uh, flexible in motion. What do I mean by that? Simple. Even though you, the enemy can't push you back, you can push them back. And then the slaughter begins. But the last account of the Gallic nobles ever having the infamous pride as they did in history would be pretty much uh, during the time of the Gallic Wars fighting against Julius Caesar. Of which, Julius Caesar committed vast war crimes and genocide to the Gallic people. And one of the worst uh, one atrocities was slaughtering the women and children, or as well even raping the women, and as well massacring the men for no reason. That's because they sided with the Celtic idealism. And in fact, the Druids would have been slaughtered, and as well, the uh, both of the hands of the Celtic chieftains and their warriors would have been cut off. And I'm not talking one of them, I'm talking about both of them. And it's actually stated that the last stronghold of the Gallic people at Duxonodunum, the uh, Roman generals were ordered to cut off the right hands of their warriors. Which, this is war crime on steroids if you ask me. So, yeah. I mean, the Celts never did anything like that, we just took their heads. Uh, but I might have to put a video on one day, like, what if Rome never conquered Gaul, or what if Rome never existed. But I'll probably have to put that in for a suggestion one day. Anyways, guys, why don't y'all get a uh, seat back and watch me move around, shall we?
know, as you all saw, me moving around this equipment and armor, I didn't feel as much fatigue as I thought I would. Now, I did two forms on how uh, they were accounted to have actually fought. One account given to us by uh, the Greeks, and the other account given us by the Romans. Now, the Greeks were a little more uh, inform informational on how they would have fought. The first account is from the Romans, as y'all saw, me swinging around like an idiot and all that. Here's the thing. The Celts would have actually fought in a unison form, especially the Gauls. They would have formed pretty much, pretty much, uh, well, because they saw how to fight against the Romans, especially the, uh, well, shield formation of a said, well, shield wall of the said Roman phalanx. Or as well, even the Greek phalanx, as we know in history. Now, now you all know what happened in the Battle of the Alia. The Romans were dressed in equipment and armor that would be used pretty much by a hoplite. So, yeah. And the Celts kind of ended up defeating the Romans that way. Now, the, the Gauls did fight as a type of boar-like charge movement, but that was just to break a shield wall. But... In order to actually uh, form a shield wall, they did form it, as you all see in the second one. Or, as you all saw in the second one, uh, me moving around, I'm moving in a type of packed formation style, pretty much throwing my javelin, then using my spear as an added reach, which it was very rare they ever used the sword. So, yeah. Now, as you all also saw, I was also using a round shield, those would actually be used by Celtic cavalry. And reason being why the Celts didn't use an oval style shield to protect themselves is because of accounts that stated that it was not actually work for them. In fact, it's actually stated that the Celts used a round shield, a small round shield, almost like a buckler size, somewhere between uh, 30 to probably even 20 inches to actually deflect that's right, deflect archery blows, or, as well, javelin throws. And the fact is, they wouldn't actually expose themselves using their leg. In other words, it wasn't a infamous cavalry charge into the ranks. What the Celtic cavalry did is that they would take their javelins and hurl them at their opponents while at a light foot. In other words, these would be type of cavalry charge they would charge by, hurl a javelin, and it would continue a cycle over and over again. They technically cooked this uh, form from their earlier chariot riding days, which chariot horsemen actually did do this. Now, the chariot was still used in Britannia, but in Gaul, they were now using regular horses, and the Celts of Gaul were masters of the horse. It's actually stated that when they charged forward, it would actually horrify the Romans so much that they saw the javelins before they saw the horses. And as soon as they came, as soon as the javelin came in contact with the Roman legions, the Romans would end up helping impaled to mostly to their face, probably, or as well, probably to their foot, by this said light javelin. And then the Celtic cavalrymen would probably char charge back around in order to get probably extra javelins, or to worse, attack. The, net, the guy to his left or the, the guy to the right. Because one, it's actually stated that the Celts of Gaul would have done a circular motion around their own infantry forces. So this actually states on how the Celts would have fought. They would have fought in a formation that would have been horrifying to the Romans. So much so, we can see why the Romans would later have them in parts of their military in order to, well, better fight against uh, other barbarians. And... The weird thing is, the Celts of Gaul would later be used as the major shock unit in order to invade the island of Britannia. So, yeah. But the thing is, the Gauls were the most horrifying warriors in history. And the fact is, the Celtic noble is one of them. Now, as you all also saw, I was even putting on scale armor. Scale armor was the biggest rarity that was ever used by the Gauls. They did use it, the Celts did use scale armor, but the problem is, it was a mixed armor. That mixed armor would be of padding, or in this case, some sort of linen, such as uh, strong cloth, such as padding, mail, and then over that would be a covering of scales. In other words, the scale would be attached to the mail itself. 
The problem is, uh, I tried my best to find someone that made something like that. Problem is, there isn't much uh, people that make something that like that type of form in Celtic. And the fact is, we don't know what it actually looked like. So yeah, I'm sorry for any of y'all that were wanting to see Celtic scale armor, but that scale armor that I do have looks near identical to how I would believe a Celt would actually use. Sleeveless and light. Because one, I love the sleeveless feel of this Celtic warrior. Because one, when I'm using this, I don't feel the fatigue in my arm. My arm is loose. It is mobile. The same with my shield arm. It is more mobile. This is kind of why I prefer sleeveless armor, such as my, well, Lord Hamata right now, my scale armor, uh, sometimes even my padding armor, and as well, even my laminar armor, which is kind of why I prefer scale, uh, I just prefer sleeveless style armor. That kind of proves I'm more Celtic than I am Germanic, so I know many people in Germany are probably going to be pissed right now, <laughs> but yeah, uh, we see why. And the fact is, I don't like having armor on my legs either. This kind of proves another thing also, because Celts didn't like wearing it much. Cavalrymen did somewhat wear it, but it was rare. And when I said rare, I mean rare. Because the further south you went in Gaul, especially along the shoreline, the more and more you would see of Roman and Greek influence, while the further north would be more of Celtic and Germanic. So we can see why the Celts dressed the way they did. but. If y'all have an idea for another Celtic how-to video for the next month of March, let me know in the comments below. I'll be happy to get right into it. Maybe we'll cover the common Celtic Gaul uh, from the 3rd to 1st century BC. Maybe we'll cover the Celtic Britons. I don't know. It's up to y'all. Or as well, maybe we'll even cover a Celtic archer. Anyways, guys, hope to see y'all in the next one. Like and subscribe for more. And as well, hope to see y'all in the next one. Have a great day, y'all.